Hi, Andy. Hi, Victoria. So today we will be speaking with Dr. Chuck Rezon about other ways to think about depression. Yeah, he's a longtime friend and colleague, and I first became interested in his work some time ago, and I'm fascinated that he's now very involved with the psychiatric uses of psychedelics. Yeah, he was here at the University of Arizona for a while and did a study where he put people in heat chambers. So he has a long history of innovative work. Great. Let's talk to him. Dr. Chuck Raison is a professor at the University of Wisconsin and serves as director of research for the USONA Institute. He is internationally recognized for his studies on novel mechanisms for the treatment of major depression, as well as for his work on the effects of compassion training. He was named one of the world's most influential researchers by Web of Science for the decade 2010 to 2019. More recently, Dr. Raison has taken a leadership role in the development of psychedelics as potential treatments for the major depression. Welcome, Chuck. Thank you. Nice to be here. And let me start by apologizing. I'm in a little bit of an echoey room because I was in a big psychedelic meeting talking about an upcoming FDA meeting. So if I sound like a tin can, that is, uh, I am in fact in a tin can. So. <laughs> well, we are certainly going to want to talk with you a little bit about psychedelics and who knows, maybe you can give us some breaking news, but let's just start with depression. It is common. And while antidepressants can certainly help some people, about a third of people don't respond. So how do you, as a practicing psychiatrist and a internationally recognized researcher in the field, think about this? Yeah, well, uh, that's a lot, a lot of why, you know, I spend a lot of time trying to find other treatment modalities. You know, I mean, anybody that works in psychiatry can tell you about all sorts of people who had really beneficial responses to an antidepressant, people who may have killed themselves that didn't. Sometimes they work really, really well for people. But what has really become clear in the last 15 years is that we and me uh, very much amongst uh, this sort of uh, overestimated their benefits and underestimated their harms. I know that's something Andy's talked about a lot. But, you know, if you look at the sum total data available to us now, it really looks like for many people, especially people that have chronic depression, the agents we have don't make them fully feel well. And so that's a big problem, number one. I've gotten really interested, though, in the problem of what do you do when antidepressants really do work well? Because then, you know, you get these situations going where somebody is doing much better on an antidepressant. And 10, 15 years ago, we would have just said, well, leave them on an antidepressant forever. But the data that has emerged suggests that that is really probably not an optimal strategy, that the longer you're on an antidepressant, the more likely you are over time to develop what's called tachyphylaxis. So you begin to lose the response. There's some evidence that the longer you're on an antidepressant, the more likely you are to become resistant to antidepressants, the more likely for sure you are if you do decide to stop to get uh, withdrawal symptoms that could be painful. But the main thing that's distressing is this evidence that even people that have been completely in remission on antidepressant for a couple of years, if they stop the antidepressant in these studies where they, they, you know, you blindly switch from staying on the antidepressant to going to placebo, the rates of crashing when you stop the antidepressant are sky high. Some studies up to 80% of people will be all the way back where they started within a year. And so at the very least, what we can say about current antidepressants is they don't modify the course of the disease so that you only get the benefit when you take them. And when you stop, most people will kind of go back to their baseline. The more concerning possibility for which there's some evidence is that they, they may actually kind of worsen the disease course and make you more vulnerable to relapse so that you, it's kind of a devil's bargain, you know, that once you're on them, you sort of bought the ticket, you might have to take the ride. And we certainly never thought that way 20 years ago. Uh, and, uh, you know, but I think more of my colleagues do, even folks that are for hardcore pharmacologists. So that's another wrinkle in all this is that, you know, there's maybe kind of no free lunch. And these agents that sit on the brain day after day after day cause changes in the brain that over time begin to work against the therapeutic benefits. 
So you have packed a lot into that. And I just want to direct a question first to Andy, which is, Andy, you have in recent years, and certainly with your book, Mind Over Meds, pointed to some of this very risk of chronic medication. Yeah, I see this as a part of a larger general problem is that when we use suppressive antagonistic medications over time, the homeostatic reaction of the body may get us into worse trouble than we had to begin with. So in other words, if you give drugs that increase serotonin at neural junctions, the body over time is going to respond by making less serotonin and dropping serotonin receptors. And then when you try to reduce the dose or get off the drug, you're left with a worse situation than you had to begin with. And I think this is a common observation now, and it's not just antidepressants, it's a whole range of our chronic medications. Absolutely. Benzodiazepines, it's been called oppositional tolerance. Uh, there's an Giovanni Fava, and exactly that the brain begins to sort of fight against another way of thinking about it. It pushes back against the changes that are when you have a drug chronically on the synapse. And it's very concerning, but it does fit. You know, why should we think the antidepressants be different than, say, a benzodiazepine like, like Valium? You know, you know that it, if you take Valium for a couple of few days in a crisis, it can really be beneficial. But if you take it for, you know, for months, and you try to stop it, the brain overreacts and overshoots. And or PPIs, Chuck, the same thing happens when you suppress stomach acid production. There's so many different drugs you can see the same pattern with. Let me ask you a, a question. I think first became interested in your work when I was researching my book, Spontaneous Happiness, and writing about depression. And I came across the cytokine hypothesis of depression, which just interested me because it seems to me we had all our eggs in the serotonin basket. And suddenly there was another way of looking at depression. How do you feel about that now? Well, I think that it's really interesting. My, my mentor, Andy Miller at Emory, has, has just been such a world leader in this space. And what we know now, I think incontrovertibly, is that, that inflammation is a pathway to depression. Not all depressed people have elevated inflammation. It, it, depending on the population, it's probably about a third of all depressed people. I mean, when we say, you know, it's when they say that depression is associated with increased inflammation, what we really mean is that average is higher, but that it's not that every depressed person is a little bit more inflamed. It's that there's a subgroup of depressed people that are considerably more inflamed. And we now know that they have different sort of patterns of brain function. They have very specific symptoms that tend to be more elevated, things like anhedonia, loss of pleasure. And they respond differently to antidepressants probably also. And interestingly, they're the only folks in the depressive sort of cohort that show an antidepressant response to anti-inflammatory agents. So yeah, so basically inflammation is one of the ways people get depressed. There is a subgroup of depressed people that have this chronic inflamed, sort of chronic inflammation. And those people have, have a different types of brain function than other depressed people, and they probably respond differently to treatments. So yeah, I think that has really now been pretty well established. So given that antidepressants in the long run might do more harm than good, and yet for some people who are terribly depressed, they still might be an essential treatment. Is there a way to discern who actually benefits, whether you have serotonin at the root cause or inflammation as the root cause or something completely different at the root cause so that we only treat the people who are most likely to benefit? Man, that is the holy grail of psychiatry, right? We've been after that for since I was knee high to a grasshopper. I mean, not as a psychiatrist, I mean, as a kid. I mean, that, that's been way, way back. And it's been very, very difficult to do because depression is such a heterogeneous condition. And because, you know, you mentioned it's so common. I think the other thing about depression is not only is it probably a whole bunch of different sort of biological conditions that we don't understand, but it's also a fairly normal human reaction to adversity. And so you're kind of swimming upstream against sort of how evolution built us. So there's a lot of reasons, I think, why it's difficult to find that sort of, the, you know, a precision medicine or, or predictive biomarkers. Interestingly, interestingly, at this point, I think the most promising predictive biomarker is not a brain chemical. It's actually an, an inflammatory chemical, a thing called C-reactive protein. And there have been several small studies suggesting that people with elevated CRP, 
which means that their inflammation is elevated, do not respond as well to serotonin and antidepressants. So the popular SSRIs like Prozac and Paxil and Zoloft don't work as well in people that have elevated inflammation. And that if you're going to stick with standard antidepressants, agents that have more sort of norepinephrine or dopamine effect, like there's an old drug called nortriptyline or a, a more recent drug called Welbutrin, Bupropion, those agents actually seem to differentially work better in people with elevated inflammation. So again, the big, big study that's directly testing this is going on at Emory uh, in Atlanta right now, and, and we'll see. But like I said, there's about four studies that have sort of pointed to this. It's not going to give you 100% certainty, but even if it helped a little bit, I think that that would be you know, very useful. So, Well, that is interesting because certainly depression has been an empirical diagnosis where we haven't necessarily had much blood work that we could look at. Are you suggesting perhaps that for any doctor who's listening that they check a CRP before they prescribe an antidepressant? Yeah. You know, I've actually begun to tell people that, and I'm very conservative, but the thing is CRP is a standardized lab test that you get. And if the larger studies turn out not to support this, I don't think you've done any worse for doing so yeah, I have actually started sort of talking to you, but the other thing I've talked about is that there are, there are also data to suggest that anti-inflammatory strategies may not be universally beneficial for depressed people. So for instance, if you look at the literature on omega-3 fatty acids in studies, there's some evidence that people that are very depressed but have low levels of inflammation actually do better with placebo. And they have to have the higher levels of inflammation to begin to get the benefit from the omega-3 fatty acids, which fits with this sort of idea that it's the people that have the increased inflammation that benefit from having it dampened. We did a study now about oh God, eight or nine years ago where we gave medically healthy depressed people who failed other antidepressants a couple of infusions of a very, very powerful anti-inflammatory agent called infliximab. It used to be marketed as Remicade. You know, it was used for like, GI problems. And it's very specific and very powerful. It just turns off inflammation. And we found that in the group of depressed people as a whole, it was no better than salt water, which was the placebo effect. Salt water worked a little better. But in the people that had elevated inflammation, it worked as an antidepressant compared to the placebo. But in the people with low inflammation, they did better with salt water, a lot better. The really interesting little story that's beginning to emerge here. And one way of looking at it, I think the, the conservative way of looking at it would be that inflammation is really relevant only for people that are depressed with high inflammation. I, my contrarian view, which is a, a sort of a mind view probably, is that there may be something in here worth understanding around inflammation where there's some depressed people that clearly blocking inflammation does not help them. So is inflammation, if it's low, is, is it doing something that we need, something that might be beneficial so that in fact, immune uh, you know, kind of systems are involved in a wider range of depressive conditions, but in different ways. And I can give you a little example from a study that we did uh, at Arizona. So, you know, as you know, we did these hypothermia studies where we looked at heat and we have this very strong finding that if you put people in the hypothermia machine and really cook them up, one of the classic inflammatory molecules called interleukin-6 goes shooting up. Now, interleukin-6 is increased in depression. It's bad. If you're if your IL-6 is elevated, you're more likely to die of cancer. You're more likely to die of dementia. You know, it's, it's a bad actor. But hyperthermia just jacks it up like crazy. And the more it goes up, the more undepressed people are over the subsequent weeks. It's short. It's time-limited. But it's really interesting. And so clearly something, there's, a, there's complexities in these systems. And I have this little pet theory that I I cannot endorse because it's just a theory, but that there may be some depressed people that actually would benefit from just a little time-limited jolt of inflammation, perhaps to do the opposite of what you talked about, Andy, you know, where it's, if something's chronically on the brain, you know, you, the brain sort of weakens, right? You know, why work out if you've got a, a body suit that does all the movements for you? So maybe you get a little bit of an adaptive stressor that's time-limited and the body responds by kind of in some way, you know, building up its resilience and, and building up some sort of immune resilience. Again, I can't prove that, but that's one of the things that we're trying to use the hyperthermia to study. And what about novel treatments for depression, things that are on the horizon? Yeah. 
So if we go back to something you said, Andy, which is, you know, why psychiatry decided to follow a sort of medicine model as opposed to a surgery model is interesting, right? So why did we think that, you know, so, you know, if you got high blood pressure, you just take a high blood pressure medicine every day. If you got diabetes, you take insulin every day. If you got depression, you just take an antidepressant every day. Where did we fall into that larger sort of schema of how these things are treated? I don't know, but we certainly did. As we all know, we can talk about that. What's interesting is that in the last half a decade or so, there's been the emergence of these treatments that in addition to having kind of quote novel mechanisms of action, have a novel administration schedule. So if we start with, with ketamine, the, the shakaru with ketamine, when people first started studying it was, a hey, first off, people felt much better very rapidly. And you give people a single dose that's in the body for a couple of hours and they still feel better a week later, right? So that, you know, kind of what's up with that? What's going on with that? And then there's this drug called brexanolone, which is a GABA-A sort of modulator. Same thing, you know, you can give it to people over a certain period of time, and then they stay undepressed for kind of a longer period of time. And then the granddaddy of these sorts of agents were the psychedelics, right? So, you know, I was just on the phone with Roland, which is why I'm speaking to you from the tin can. You know, he and the guys at NYU showed that, you know, you give people that are depressed and anxious and have a potentially lethal cancer a single treatment with a high dose of psilocybin, and the vast majority of them feel completely in remission six months later. So, you know, you got a drug that's in the body for eight hours, and you got people saying they feel better for this extended period. And, you know, so what's on the horizon that I'm most excited about is not just these individual agents, but the potential that there may be pharmacologic interventions that don't fall into that taking it every day, it's all on the brain and you're weakening the systems, but rather really kind of treatments that might be like adaptive stressors where, boom, you're, they're, they're on the body for a short period of time, in the brain for a short period of time, and they set in motion downstream changes that become to some degree self-sustaining, right? You don't need to do the psilocybin every three days. It may not last forever, but you've set in motion a sort of internally generated and sustained resilience sort of function or pattern. And that to me is the, what I think is going to be the sort of hope for the pharmacologic treatment of at least some of our psychiatric conditions. And, you know, my fingers are crossed because I really think that it's, it will help us avoid exactly what you articulated, Andy. This fact, when the drug is always doing what the body should be doing, the body quits doing it. You know, you said it could be an adaptive stressor, but I'm just wondering, so much is being written now about the psychedelics. Do you have a sense beyond that of the mechanism of the, what is actually happening as you rewire the brain? Well, that's a great question. And we, we're we actively pursuing it in the objects I can tell you about, one of the wild things that I know of trying to look at this. So the big question in psychedelics is, uh, the big theoretical question is, well, how do they work? How is this possible? And there's two schools of thought, and there's two camps, and they're, they're heading off in these sort of different commercial directions. The, the more sort of standard school of thought is that, that these agents must be essentially purely biological agents. And so what we really want to do is to take something like psilocybin and tweak the molecule until we find one that doesn't have psychedelic effects that you could take at home. And that would miraculously make you feel undepressed for six months, right? I mean, that is the holy, and actually two months would even be better, maybe two weeks because you had some more pills. But, you know, that essentially there's a way to distill out the antidepressant effect from the experiential effects of the psychedelics. And, you know, I never say never to anything. That's the problem. Well, it's kind of what people have been doing with cannabis, right? They've been playing with the plant. Yeah. So the molecules to try and create a mix that doesn't make people stoned, <laughs> but yes. still gives the beneficial effects. Exactly. I mean, that's that's the history of the mechanistic perspective on the West. And, you know, it's given us all sorts of things that are very valuable and they may succeed in doing that. If you look at currently available psychedelics, most studies suggest there's something about the acute experience that predicts the longer term outcome. And so, and not just anything about the acute experience, but it, the it, it, psychedelic experiences that have certain elements seem to be more beneficial. And, and those, there's a little bevy of those elements. So one of the ones that's been most studies, but something is called a mystical experience, which has with people getting this profound 
bodily felt, sometimes inability to explain, sense that they're deeply connected to all sorts of things they didn't think they were connected to before. God, other people, the planet, that their life fits into a larger pattern in some meaningful way. And, you know, people all of a sudden feel like it makes sense in a way that it didn't before. When that happens, people tend to get a lot happier. They get they tend to quit smoking. They tend to quit drugging. The other thing that happens that seems to be useful is people will often go through very difficult experiences with psychedelic. This goes back to the kind of maybe adaptive stressor idea that, you know, it's like you, you see all your demons in, in, in an hour and a half, right? And people will have these really difficult emotional experiences. But folks have shown in small studies that if that happens and a person through the psychedelic experience feels like they've either accepted those things or that they're going to change those things or that they've somehow dealt with them, that also is strongly associated with good therapeutic outcomes, right? So trying to understand what is it about the conscious experience acutely that sets people up longer term is, I think, one of the places to go looking. And so one of the things that we're doing is looking at whether, in fact, the conscious experience is required for psychedelics to have an antidepressant effect, right? And when you begin to think about consciousness, you know, it really means at least a couple of things. One is you, you're pretty convinced you're conscious right now. But, you know, a year from now, you're not going to really remember much about this podcast unless I say something horrible that gets solved from, right? But you're conscious, right? But the other part of consciousness is the sort of memory, right, that we, we take with us. And, and so we've actually started a study at Wisconsin where we are uh, in the sort of piloting phases of giving people, in this case, psilocybin, but co-administering it with midazolam, which is at, at a certain dose, it gives people kind of a blackout. They're awake they're experiencing, but they don't remember afterwards. And, and so we're kind of curious to see, can we kind of peel the onion? And if we give people a psychedelic experience they cannot remember, does it still have that therapeutic effect? And it might or it might not. You know, it's, it's interesting. If it still does, then that suggests that you don't have to remember it to get the benefit that it maybe it's something to do with the experience while it's happening or the brain activity while it's happening. And of course, if on the other hand, if you don't remember it, you're like, well, you know, that was nothing. Then you don't need to go further than trying to understand what is it doing to memory and to the consolidation of memory that is inducing these, these, these sort of therapeutic benefits. Now, what the biology, what the neurobiology of that underneath is, that's, we've got fancy EEGs and all this stuff. That's a thornier issue. But just one of the things that psychedelics let us do is they really do serve as probes for the causal power of consciousness to see does conscious experience as we just typically understand consciousness, does it or the brain activity that produces it or subserves it, you know, can't, does it really have a long-term causative effect, the ability to change us? If we want to be optimistic, I think that's a really nice human story. I, that's, I'm voting for it. I'm hoping for it, you know, but we're actually trying to test it. I don't know. It, it it rings to me of our society's discomfort with psychedelic medicines that we're going to say, okay, we'll give you a psychedelic, which we think will lead to an improvement in your mood state and resolution of your depression, but we won't let you remember it because we don't want you to have had a psychedelic experience that you remember. <laughs> so, you know, interestingly, that, well, so interestingly, my bias is towards, I'm hoping that we'll actually show that if you don't remember it, it doesn't happen because that would be consistent with, but, you know, I had to jump through some hoops to get approval to do this. And the, the gentleman who finally made the approval is kind of a hardcore biochemist. And he said exactly what you said, Victoria. He said, this is a great study because, you know, you can sort of knock people out and they wouldn't have to have a psychedelic experience. <laughs> so, so you're right. There's that. And, and again, the, the folks that are, that are doing the much more sophisticated thing of trying to find a pill that doesn't give you an experience, that is totally what they're after. Whereas my vantage point, because of my own biases, I'm really rooting for the experience. I hope very much that it turns out that the, the neurobiology of consciousness turns out to be integral to how these agents do their deed, because that would, you know, that would perhaps allow psychiatry to have some kind of remarriage with psychotherapy, which would be very positive. Body of Wonder is produced by the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of Arizona. Internationally recognized for innovative health and wellness programs, evidence-based research, and clinical standards. The center offers listeners a wide range of free resources to live and maintain a healthy lifestyle, including online learning, meditations, and short videos. To find out more, go to azcim.org.
azcim.org slash podcast. That's azcim.org slash podcast. Andy, we are witnessing such a dramatic increase in depression, anxiety, and mental health disorders. I mean, the CDC said that 13% of adults over 18 used antidepressants in the last 30 days. That was before the pandemic. That was 2015 to 2018 data. What is happening in our society? What, why are we in this crazy position? You know, Victoria, I wrote about that in Spontaneous Happiness. I think the reasons are complex. One is how much of this is real, how much is a creation of the pharmaceutical industry that's been very successful at convincing people that ordinary states of sadness are matters of disordered brain biochemistry that require treatment. We're not supposed to be happy all the time. There also may be some value in depression. You know, there's a strong correlation between depression and creativity. You know, many of our greatest writers, artists, musicians have suffered from depression. Many have used alcohol or drugs to deal with that. Some have committed suicide, but they're linked. And there has been some very interesting writing by evolutionary psychologists about the value of depression, that it may that people who were genetically predisposed to depression might do better at problem solving because you have a state of inward concentration and focus. And so in as our species was developing, those people might have been the ones that were successful at dealing with very difficult situations. Then you look at all the things that, are, that are, have changed in our society compared with hunter-gatherer societies where depression is almost non-existent. You know, when you look at how our diets have changed, they're much more pro-inflammatory. We're disconnected from nature. We have disordered cycles of sleeping. We're exposed to all sorts of noise. There are so many factors. We, we have had a breakdown of social relations, much accentuated in this time of pandemic. You know, so I think there are just so many factors that enter into this. What he said. <laughs> but also, Victor, one thing I pointed out, which I think is interesting, is that when I ask people, you know, why, why are so many people depressed? The common answer I get is, well, look at the state of the world. Look at the state of the economy. And my parents lived through the Great Depression, which was much worse than anything we're experiencing. They lived through World War II, which is the most horrific experience of the 20th century. And all the indications were that mental, emotional health was better in those periods than it is today. So I don't think you can use those kind of facile explanations as to why there is this epidemic of depression. Andy, in Spontaneous Happiness, you actually point to a whole array of uh, lifestyle changes that people can make that potentially would help resolve at least, let's say, mild to maybe moderate depression. Where are you with that now? And, and Chuck, as a psychiatrist, how do you see uh, or what effect do you see from the range of, of changes people can make from physical activity to nutrition to potentially having different kind of light exposure, especially if you're in a place where there's long winter nights? <laughs> like Wisconsin, where I am. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's let Andy answer because he's going to say the same thing I am, or I'm going to say the same thing he is. There are may- so many possibilities. There's practicing gratitude. There is not letting depressing things into your consciousness. Uh, no, don't read sad novels and listen to sad songs or be around sad people. You know, moods are contagious and we have very good data on how a mood spread through groups just like infectious diseases. So, you know, if you have a happy friend that lives within a half mile, you're more likely to be happy. And if the distance increases beyond a certain point, the effect falls off. I mean, so those are simple steps you can take. And then there's, then there's you know, practicing meditation. As I said, practicing gratitude. I think that there's so many things that people can do before you resort to medication. Yep. And, and agreed. And of course, physical exercise. I mean, I literally have just now been horrible, but I finally got myself back on a treadmill in the morning. I mean, I feel better. And I am in Wisconsin and I have really good seasonal affective disorder, you know, <laughs> and I've got my light. I've got my light in the morning. It, it helps. 
And then the other thing is, and I have troubles with this. I, 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 I hate vegetables, which is just, <laughs> but, but I am really convinced now that what you eat, you know, if you're horribly depressed and you change your diet, you're not going to get undepressed in a week. But the data that if you just eat healthier day in, day out, over time, that you're less likely to be depressed and that it's going to make a difference. The data are really powerful. I mean, I think what you eat, how you exercise, and the social stuff that Andy was talking about, I mean, those are three just key areas that can have a big influence, especially if they're done consistently over time. I think they have a lot of protective potential. So good as prevention, but maybe a little bit more limited as treatment. Perhaps when people get really, really depressed. But even there. Even I mean, there, yeah. Even there, man. I I would not suspend those there. No, I, I think that in a better world, these things would be the bedrocks of how we treated non-psychotic depression. And psychotherapy. The other thing, yeah. A good psychotherapy. I mean, and there's a caveat there. Of course, we don't put FDA approval on individual therapists. But psychotherapy really is helpful for people very often. So that's another... Yeah, all these things, of course, psychotherapy, you know, there's there's challenges with finding a therapist and the cost and stuff. But some of these other things are sort of even easier to implement. And, you know, I mean, I, since I talked about heat, hyperthermia, and we've, now there's several studies, like four or five, that suggest that periodic episodic exposure, to, you know, basically sauna, but like high heat exposure for for some people, like everything more than others, can really be an antidepressant. I mean, in our study we did in Arizona, you know, we gave people a single treatment and they felt better for weeks afterwards. So, you know, just another little trick that is something that shown hot baths now, and there's actually a study showing that it has, you know, a modest but appreciable antidepressant effect. So there's another little thing that many of us can sort of implement to one degree or other. What are the things that you see on horizon that you're really interested in? Well, I, you know, I think the mainstreaming of integrative medicine is is proceeding apace, and that's very gratifying. Victoria, how how do you see progress in psychiatry? What's happened with our integrative medicine and residency there? So, integrative medicine and residency is a program that our center has, which is about a two hundred hour curriculum that gets embedded into existing residency program. So it's not a separate or a different program. We have four different psychiatry residencies that are now embedding that into their general psychiatry residency education. And that's terrific. We've also had a lot of psychiatrists come into our fellowship over the years. I think we're close to a hundred. So folks who are just saying, you know, there's there's a, a broader role that they want to play than being the prescribers of pills and having very short visits with their patients. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, no place needs an integrated approach more than psychiatry. Every place needs it, but God Almighty, man, it's so. I think the other thing that is on the horizon, but you know, we haven't talked about still confusing is the microbiome and uh, you know, the second brain. What how do we alter the the gut so that we improve mental health. And clearly there are many studies suggesting that that's doable, but I don't think that there's a clear path for everybody. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I don't think that uh, that's my read on it because I've I've kind of taken a little dive back into it lately. We we actually did a study in Arizona where we gave older adults dogs looking to see if it enhanced their microbiome. Interestingly, not so clear it enhanced their microbiome, but it lowered their inflammation. It's pretty but yeah, you know, the, there's a bit of a needle in the haystack problem. I mean, that, that is, they say, the second most complex ecosystem after our brain and that we know of the universe, you know, which probably is why it's able to contribute to our thoughts and feelings. But I agree. I mean, I think the data that to some degree the organisms in our guts are getting a vote on who we are is really becoming pretty clear. And then figuring out, you know, how do we gauge with them in ways that offer up win-win scenarios for them and us, right? I mean, I was saying this back 15 years ago, that that how we think about our relationships with the microbial world is going to be a major player in the 21st century now, because it's long before COVID, but boy, COVID really brings that home. You know, we are the scorched earth policy that we've had towards the microbial world in the 20th century is probably not going to be sustainable, right? I mean, we always think about about bacteria, but even with viruses, right? So trying to figure out how do we how do we enter into peaceful relationships with that world is going to be really, really 
important for our mental health because clearly, as I say, they get a vote. So that's actually one of the most exciting areas that I know of that I kind of flirted with it and very quickly saw that it was complex beyond my capacity to do more than be sort of an armchair guy on it. The mathematics and everything are really intense, but it's really interesting. And I do think that we'll unlock more there over the next next few years. So as the director of research for USONA, can you give us any insight into how far we are from FDA approval for psychedelics, for depression and anxiety? Yeah, with some caveats. So I think that it is fairly likely that, in fact, this is not USONA, it's actually Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. They had a very positive phase three trial for MDMA for post-traumatic disorder. Phase three of the large studies, you need to have two positive ones to get approval from the FDA. They are more than halfway through with their second one. And they have just recently done some financial deals that are going to give them, I think, the, the funding to actually be able to commercialize it. I think it's very likely that MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for post-traumatic stress disorder may see approval in, they say 23, but I, I don't believe, them, but I think 24. Psilocybin, you know, there's there's several organizations that are in this space now. So USONA is about between two-thirds and three-quarters of the way done with a first 100-person phase two study in major depression. There is a large commercial entity called Compass Pathways. They are not, they're actually looking at treatment-resistant depression. They published their phase two results, and we can talk long time about it. It's very interesting. It, it suggests that for people that are chronically depressed, that psychedelics are not going to be a miracle cure, but they do have a signal. Assuming that these studies show positivity in phase three, I would think that psilocybin for depressive disorders is, you know, we don't say ever, but three, four or five years away, something like that, maybe, you know, things go well. So I think certainly by the end of this decade, if the studies bear it out, I think there'll be several psychedelics on offer. And then the other thing to keep an eye on is the things like the Oregon Initiative, right? So, for, you know, so you may not know about this, but Oregon passed this, what seemed to me incredible initiative at the time to basically allow people to use psilocybin mushrooms in a psyche, in a psychological setting, so that in a therapeutic setting. So you got to come up with the mushrooms and you got to go to a, a sort of a trained therapist, I think. But, but there's people are buying up swaths of land. Retreat centers in Europe are buying up swaths of land to set up large retreat centers in Oregon. I think Oregon is going to become, you know, if this really goes forward, it's going to be this place where if you say to me, Chuck, God, I've got my, you know, my son-in-law is so depressed and I it's failed stuff. I want to even try him on a psychedelic. I'll probably say go to Oregon. And so this is really interesting because this is a way, potentially, it kind of gets around the FDA a little bit, which is why USONA doesn't take a position one way or the other, but it's happening and it's interesting and it's something to watch for sure. And so that is slated, I believe, in 23 to start. So there we may begin to see things even sooner. So yeah, I think by 2025, there's going to be a couple of options in psychedelics for folks that are struggling with mental illnesses in the United States. Well, Chuck, it is always interesting to talk with you. Thank you so much for being on our podcast. Thank you for your truly innovative research and for all your thoughtfulness about these challenging issues. Well, thank you. It's sure good to see you guys. I, I miss her. Yeah, good to see you, Chuck. Yeah, be well. And, you know, I'm going to come out at some point. Well, let us know. It'd be great to see you. Listeners, this is Dr. Victoria Mazes. We would love for you to send us your questions for Andy, myself, or for our guests. You can call us and leave a voicemail by dialing 520-621-3950. Again, 520-621-3950. Or you can submit a question by going to our website, azcim.org slash podcast. Again, azcim.org slash podcast. We will review your questions and try to answer as many as possible on our programs.
We hope you enjoyed this episode of Body of Wonder brought to you by the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine. If you like the show, please rate us five stars, follow the show, and leave a review. To learn more about integrative healing and the center, go to azcim.org slash podcast. That's azcim.org slash podcast.